Good morning and Merry Christmas. My name is Cody. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining me this morning on Christmas. If this is your first time joining us online, thank you so much for doing so and taking the time uh, out of your day, especially as we celebrate our Lord and Savior's birth. Uh, I also got a couple announcements just to kind of go over before we dive in. One is that we are starting um, one service in January 1st, which will be next Sunday. Uh, we'll love for you to come out. It's going to be at 10 a.m. And so we'll love for you to come out to also come and join us for our new series called The Domino Effect. I'm here as we walk through the book of Genesis. Um, so we got some things happening in January, and we're also starting a Bible reading plan from January to next December. We're going to walk through the meta narrative of Scripture. And so we've got a couple things coming up in January. We'll love to see you next week as we kick things off in our Domino series. And again, we'll be one service. Uh, we're going to do an experiment from January to, to July and see what God does with one service. So. Uh, if you have your Bibles around you, uh, we're going to look at Luke 2, starting in chapter, chapter 2, verse 21. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, then don't worry, I'm going to read them to you. So, this ends our Advent series. So, we are, this concludes, uh, and we're going to talk about Jesus' circumcision. So, we're going to look at Luke 2, 21 through 24. Would you read with me? It is when the eight days were completed of his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification in accordance with the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. What is beautiful right here is that it's kind of stating that Jesus' parents were also faithful to the Jewish law. They were faithful to God and what he commanded in back in Jerusalem. Since this offering is usually kind of made by individuals who have not a plethora of money uh, typically they would want a ram or a bull offering but if you couldn't afford that then two pigeons or turtle doves will have to do which actually identifies who jesus came it will be the poor that will enter the kingdom of god it will be the meek who will enter the kingdom of god Jesus said himself that he came for not those who do not need a physician, but for those who do. However, this is not about their social status. Luke is making clear that his parents are not spiritual rebels, but faithful followers of the Mosaic Law. Let's continue in verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and he and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Well, let's think about this image. If, if the Spirit of God promised you that you would see the coming of Jesus, the second coming, what would you do? Would you probably anticipate it every day? Like today? Now? Mine? Mine? Now? 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 Like kids do every Christmas. But then something happens as an anticipation of, is it today? Is it today? Verse 27. It says, Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God. And he said, Now, Master, said this to the child, Now, Master, you can dismay your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation 
You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Again, we have the Spirit of God behind Jesus' birth and now even faithful here in this moment. God was faithful to his promise as he promised him that he would not see death until he, that he saw the Messiah. And he's faithful in his promises today also. See, Simeon makes a proclamation that his eyes have seen the Lord's salvation. Uh, a commentator has said this, that to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. They are inseparable. There is joy even in the face of death when one has seen the source of life. Simeon's job as a watchman for the Messiah is done. The Lord can take him home. And Simeon pictures a faithful servant who is at home in God's purpose and plan, even when his time is up. Something to think about. What would be our last request before we die? Like for Simeon, the Lord promised him that he will see the Messiah. He will see the salvation that God long ago before he will go home. And he was ready and he rejoiced in God's salvation. What would be your final request? Would it reflect that of Christ? Would it reflect that of Simeon? Would that reflect of saints from past? What's special about this salvation, as Simeon said, that it's for all people. For all people. Jews, Gentiles, every race, every ethnicity. It is for all people. In two ways, too. One, it will be a light of revelation for the Gentiles. To think that Gentiles will be a part of God's salvation wasn't, wasn't the current thoughts or practices in the, in the Jewish customary time. Now, back in the Old Testament, there would be several times that the Messiah would bring salvation to the Gentiles. Those prophecies you can go back to in Psalms and, and the prophets. And so you can go back to those. But right here, right now, Gentiles are known as sinners. And so, for to be part of God's salvation, that flipped things over. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to flip things over. Yeah, as we have seen a little bit about in his birth, it's not what a royal person, like his place where he was born, was that royalty, but yet was poverty. Because he came for those in poverty. He came to be a light and a revelation to the Gentiles. But also, it became something for the Jews, too. It was for, him, for them to see his glory, which some saw his glory at the transfiguration that we will see later on in, in Scripture, that he invited three individuals to see his transfiguration, to see partial of his glory, at his transfiguration, and you can look back in the, in the Synoptic Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke has the transfiguration of Christ, where they, will, they saw his robe shiny, and they saw him talking to Elijah and Moses, that he had the power to bring people from heaven to have conversations with. So they saw partial of his glory, because then it went away, but came true. Some did see the glory. Of God. They were of Jewish descent. But they also miss it. Just as Gentiles miss the revelation of God in Scripture, well also Jews will miss God's glory in Jesus Christ. However, God doesn't leave them in the dark. Just look at what is said next about um, Joseph and Mary. Verse 33. Let's see. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary. 
Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What a great Christmas message, right? Simeon just told Mary that Jesus was going to cause a disruption within Israel. And he will be combated. Well, this comes true is when Jesus in 5, John 15, verse 18 through 19, Jesus says this about the world and this war that comes. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, if the world hates you, I understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you, out of it, the world hates you. What Simeon says in Luke 2 happens throughout the Gospels. Jesus causes a polarization within his people and the Gentiles. They don't know what to do with him. They don't, you know, sometimes they don't know whether they should arrest him, beat him, kill him, or hire him because he does also healings and miraculous signs. The sinners and tax collectors celebrated him while his own people called him crazy. In fact, his family did. But the world did this to Jesus, and as what John said, we quoted the words of Jesus, well, people also will do that with Jesus' followers. In fact, Paul says that people will consider us foolish. But the worst of all, the proclamation that Simeon gave to Mary, not this, there will be disruption, fall and rise, but he uses the analogy of a sword piercing her own soul. But there's a reason. So that hearts may be revealed. Oh, this may not seem like good news. However, if you have cancer, what do you want a surgeon to do? You want him to leave it in there? You want him to massage it? No. You want him to cut you open and to remove the cancer. You're like, wow, that's very... Kind of went that way. However, what about this then? If you have a, what about a counselor or a psychologist? What do they typically do? They make an individual go back to the dark thing that they don't want to talk about. To bring up the pain. Why do they do that? To walk through it. To heal from it. So what a surgeon, a psychologist, or a counselor, their job is sometimes to bring up pain and sorrow or even cut us open. Why? So that healing may begin. So if you're wondering what the sword was for Mary, I can think no other image than when Mary saw her son upon a cross and a spear literally went into her son and his blood poured out like water. Mary was there and saw all that happened to her son. See, following Jesus, as Mary did, it cost her something. Something so painful that no parent ever really wants to experience and has to see the death of a child. This sword piercing her own soul is convicting and true. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the author of Hebrews wrote in chapter 4, verse 12 to 13 this, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hearts revealed. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him. We must give an account. 
God's word is like a sword that penetrates our thoughts, intentions, motives of our hearts. As Jesus said, as Simeon proclaimed to Mary, that you will be pierced so that hearts may be revealed. God's word pierced our hearts to see our motives, our intentions. Jesus is described as the word of God that became flesh in John chapter 1. Which means Jesus, if the word of God is penetrating like a double-edged sword, and Jesus is called the word of God and became flesh and was God in John 1, it sounds like Jesus didn't come to make us comfortable or happy. He came after our hearts to change what makes us happy for us to be satisfied in him. No one will be able to hide from Jesus as Hebrews stated for he is the word of God and all will be held accountable. No one will be escaping that. I know this may seem very discouraging you know, like oh gosh maybe depressing but there's good news here. This news of Jesus holding everybody accountable like a sword. There's light even in the midst of this. Because all it takes for us not to be in that fear of accountability or judgment in the sword, what draws us away from that fear is actually repentance. See, repentance is like hydrogen peroxide. It cleans out the wound. It removes bacteria in a cut. For peroxide can sting, like alcohol also can sting. But the sting is worth it because it's letting you know it's working. See, if you don't clean a cut, it can get infected. And infection can cause sometimes limbs to fall off. In the worst case, infections can kill you. Sin is like an infection. It destroys our health. And the cure for it is to turn back to God. Repentance. To repentance, you have to come to an understanding that you are not in control of your destiny. Right? You're confessing the dependency on God and not yourself. We have to realize that we do not know everything. Now, yes, we are weak and have limitations. And we don't want to admit it, but it's true. But the peace that we're so desperately searching for comes through pain. The self-acknowledgement of our shortcomings, of our sin. But the peace will come when we're, want, when we're willing to surrender. To have our cut clean out. Not by our cells by something pure and holy this is what Simeon was telling Mary there's going to be pain but the salvation that Jesus brings will be so worth it it's so worth it because it's by Jesus' blood that we are healed it will be by his cuts that we will have salvation it's by his blood which is the Lamb of God that will be made new. We will have revelation of his glory. We are healed by his wounds, which is a fulfillment of prophecy, Isaiah 53. Jesus was and is the greatest Christmas gift, and the grace which he supplies surpasses any gift that we can probably get today. I would, I would say, any gift that we get today. Because what he supplies and gives is eternal. The clothes, the toys, the whatever jewelry you get, all of it will fade away and be destroyed. Or pass on and somebody's going to sell it. Not everybody wants our crap. But Jesus, what he gives, what he supplies, now that's that's forever. And it's from the Lord. And James says, 
All good things come from the Father. His salvation is good. It is true. It will sing, but it's true and it's good. And if you want to deepen your relationship with Jesus today, I have some next steps for you. Number one, if you haven't done this, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you're like, Cody, how do I do this? Well, easily. You can email, email us to let us know. Um, you can come in January, fill out a Connect card, and let us know. Uh, you can comment right now, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Say, hey, I, I want to further my relationship with Jesus. Um, we would love to help you and support you. And again, this confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior is realizing our dependency on Him and not ourselves. If we too would want to see the coming of Christ, like Simeon, Paul, the Messiah, if we are in that anticipation, waiting for Christ to come, it starts here. To accept Him as Lord and Savior, that He is the salvation that we so desperately want and if you said yes to that, I've already, Jesus is my salvation, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, then here's my challenge for you, is to get into God's Word so that God's Word can get into you. Do you think Simeon was faithful just watching TV? No. He was faithful because of what God had revealed to him in his Word. And he holds true to God's Word and saw a promise fulfilled. If you too would love to see a promise fulfilled, we must be in God's word to know the promises of God so we can hold on to them. Get into God's word so that God's word can get into us. But we have a couple ways for that to happen. One, you can start the reading plan that we are starting next week. If you're like, Cody, how do I get that? I'm so glad you asked. You can look on our website. You can see the memory card on there. You can come, get the memory card, get a reading plan. We'll supply anything that we can for you to dive into God's Word. We have Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. Let us know. Um, we would love to get and to help you be involved in God's Word. And the next is we're actually starting small groups in February. So no longer are we trying to supply for you and God to have that personal relationship. We want you to have a relationship with a community of believers in God's Word together. Because there's something that happens with you and God, but also with a community of believers as we do. In Jesus' circumcision right here, there's a community that is already, already around Jesus. We too need a community of one another. Uh, step three is come and hear our new series. It's called The Domino Effect. See how it all starts. And how, how it all kind of starts and falls and rises. Because Jesus is in the midst of it too. So if you are needing of any direction of uh, God's word, please let us know. We have some ways reading plan, small groups starting. We'll love to supply you in a way that we can so that you can deepen your relationship with Jesus. But what we do know is that that takes prayer. So if you have a prayer request, you would love to pray, uh, have us pray for you, please let us know. Um, you can do so again by commenting. You can come and fill out a connect card with your prayer request. You can also um, you know, let us know, uh, email us. Um, personally, or go to our contact us and send a prayer request. We love to pray for you. I pray for the church every week, and we love to lift you up in prayer. So help us come together in community and pray for one another. And you can do so by reaching out, either commenting, emailing, come, filling out the connect card. We have multiple ways for us to help pray for you. We're so glad you joined us this morning on Christmas, and hopefully this message was an encouraging of just understanding of Jesus' birth, why he came. He came out of love for us, for we did not know love until he came. We thank you so much 
I want to pray. God, thank you so much for this morning as we came together and to hear about your goodness and your love. That, Lord, that you have the greatest love story for us. And, Lord, that we need you. Oh, God, we need you. Help us see what you are revealing as you did with Simeon. Help us to receive what you gave Mary, the proclamation of pain, that there is joy in the morning. And it's because you supply it. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you come back next week as we start our new series. Thank you so much. Have a good morning.